Hey, I've told you when the kids were little, I told you that we would sing in the car all the time. And don't worry, we're not going to do another quartet thing right this minute. But we did sing in the car a lot. The other thing that we did all the time when they weren't interested in singing is I would ask them trivia questions. Now, this is absolutely true. I'm not pulling your leg. I'd ask trivia questions to them. I don't know why. I always had a pretty quick uh, memory. They were blessed with pretty quick memory. And so you can teach uh, facts, little quick answers to questions, and it's almost like the appearance of smarts without really necessarily having to be terribly smart. You just know the answer to a lot of questions. And so we'd be in the car, and I'd say, okay, who kicked the longest field goal in NFL history? And they'd fight to say, Tom Dempsey, 63 yards, 1970, New Orleans Saints. It's like, that's exactly right. Um, I would say maybe, uh, tell me the four presidents that were assassinated. Do y'all know? Garfield, McKinley, Lincoln, and John, uh, um, Kennedy. So they would know. I'm not as quick as I used to be. I used to be able to do that pretty quick. Most home runs at the time, Hank Aaron, 755. And so they would know the answer. Longest hitting streak, Joe DiMaggio. Uh, 56 games. What year was that? 1941. Who was the batting champion? 1941. Ted Williams. What did he hit? 406. Anyway, you just, just quick little things that would add. Means nothing. But they would, they would kind of be able to spit that out real fast. Music. Who had the most number one hits of anybody that's ever been on Billboard? The Beatles. That's right. 20 number one hits. The Beatles, 20 number one hits. Mariah Carey, 18. Elvis Presley, 17. Highest selling album of all time, Michael Jackson, Thriller, and that was big, 42 million, certified sold. Guess who's number two? Certified sold, The Eagles, their greatest hits album, 32 million. Guess who's three? This will make music people just kind of roll over. Would you believe Shania Twain? Bee Gees would have been just that, but Shania Twain. Now others, ACDC claims uh, more, Pink Floyd claims more, but uh, you know, just a little trivia. Now here's my point. Knowing a lot of facts in the final analysis means nothing. You can know all the history answers to the questions, but not really know history. You can know all the music answers to all the Billboard top 10 songs. You can know all of that, but not really know music. You can know all the football answers and baseball answers and basketball answers, but not really know sports. And I think there's a huge application to what I want to talk to you about today. This is a big deal. And I'm, my message is going to be short, but I want you to get this big, big, big point. Let's first look at the definitions we looked at last week. We talked about a fan and a follower. Do you remember? We said last week on the screen, you can see it again, a fan is an enthusiastic admirer. That's what a fan is, an enthusiastic admirer. We said a follower, on the other hand, was a person who accepts the leadership of another. And I want to suggest to you a fan might know the answers to a lot of questions concerning a subject, but a follower is someone who is walking differently because they know the person they're following. They know the person they're following. Not just facts about them, they know them. Now, in the Bible, we read about a group of religious leaders known as the Pharisees. Normally, when we say Pharisee in church, we all kind of, you know, it's like hiss. We just want to hiss the Pharisees, but... In that day and time, Pharisees were, you wanted Pharisees to be living around you. I mean, it's like, it's like living in a gated community with the rich of the rich, the highest of the high, the smartest of the smart. The Pharisees were that group. They were the ones that you're proud to say, look, these are my neighbors. This is, you know, it was a big deal. Pharisees were the ones who took seriously following God. They, they knew the answers to all the questions. The Pharisees knew a lot about God. When somebody ever wanted to play Bible Trivial Pursuit, the Pharisees won every time. Or Godopoly, Pharisees, they would know all the answers. Or Bible Baseball, where you get to go first base, second base, third base, based on your answers, the Pharisees were the ones you wanted on your team. They knew a lot of answers to questions about God, but what we discover about Pharisees is they didn't really know God. They knew the answers, but they didn't know God. Jesus spoke of this in Matthew 15, 8. Look on the screen. Jesus said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Sadly, this fits a lot of people who go to church. It fits me. Much of my life, it fits me. 
Like the Pharisees, many have given their minds to study God, but they've never surrendered their hearts to really knowing God. There are men who had plenty of knowledge about God, but if you talk to them, you realize they don't know him. This is what separates fans from followers. Last week we talked about that. We want to be followers, not just fans. Now, Luke chapter 7 is the story I want to tell you about. It's, it's the end of Luke chapter 7. It's one of the great stories in the Bible. And it involves a Pharisee who invites Jesus over to his house for dinner. Now, we assume that the Pharisee has heard Jesus speak and it thinks it's an a, a important thing for Jesus to come to his house. Maybe the invitation was made after Jesus had finished one of his teachings. We're not sure. But Simon wanted to have Rabbi Jesus over. And I think Simon figured this would be considered a plus in the religious world. It would show people that he was inclusive. It would show people that he was studious. It would show people that he was wanting to be up to date with the latest and the greatest teachings. And so he says, Jesus, would you come to my house to eat? Now, Jesus should have been considered a guest of honor at a meal at Simon's house. That should have been what took place. But it quickly becomes apparent that Simon was spending time with Jesus out of a sense of duty or maybe just to impress people, but he was not treating Jesus like a guest of honor. You see, there were certain rules in the ancient world about how to show etiquette to a guest of honor. For instance, the customary greeting of an honored guest would have been a kiss. In the ancient world, you would have greeted an honored guest with a kiss. If the guest was a person of equal social rank, you would have kissed them on the cheek. If they were higher social rank than you, you would have kissed them on the hand, but you would have kissed them in the ancient world. To neglect giving a kiss of greeting was the equivalent to openly ignoring somebody coming into your house. It would be like having someone come into your home and you refusing to even acknowledge their presence with the nodding of your head or saying hello or shaking their hand. A hand it would be like you're just ignoring them totally. Another part of first century Middle East etiquette involved the washing of feet. This was a big deal. The washing of feet was mandatory before meals. If you truly wanted to honor your guest, you would do it yourself. You would get down on your knees and you would wash their feet. Or you might have your servant wash the feet of your honored guest. But at the very least, you would provide water for your guest to wash his own feet. That was a big deal. And if it was an especially distinguished guest, you might also give them some olive oil and anoint their head with oil. That would be something that you would do. It was inexpensive, but it was still considered an especially hospitable gesture. It was something you did if you really wanted to show someone that you honored them. That's what you would do. So Jesus comes to the home of Simon, and guess what? There's no kiss of greeting. There's no washing of his feet. There's no oil for his head. And these were not accidental oversights. This was something... Simon wanted to say he knew Jesus, he had talked to Jesus, he knew what Jesus was all about, but he didn't really know Jesus. Don't miss the irony of this. This is a big deal. Simon has spent his entire life studying the scriptures. He is a Pharisee. He spent the first 12 years of his life memorizing the first 12 books of the Bible. I'm not saying just memorizing the order of the books. I'm saying memorizing the content verse by verse by verse. By the time he was 12, he would have known the first 12 books of the Bible by memory. By the time he was 15, he would have known the entire Old Testament by memory. He would have known that there are more than 300 prophecies about the coming Messiah. He would have had each one of those prophecies memorized, yet he doesn't realize it is the Messiah who now sits at his table with a hand that hasn't been kissed, feet that haven't been washed, and a head that hasn't been anointed with oil, all of those things he had the power to do, and he just misses it because he knows stuff, but he doesn't know Jesus. He doesn't love Jesus. Fans have a tendency to do this. They confuse their knowledge for intimacy. They don't recognize the difference between knowing about Jesus and truly knowing Jesus. And we, the church, are to blame. We have established systems of learning that result in knowledge, but not necessarily intimacy. Think about it. We love having Bible studies. Let's study, everybody. Many include workbooks where we fill out the workbooks. We go through a Bible curriculum that also, also often has homework for us to do. My sermons come with a little outline for you to fill in the, uh, the blanks. We don't call them sermons anymore. We call them lessons. If you grew up in church, you probably went to Sunday 
school where you had a teacher. In summertime, where did we go? Vacation, Bible, school. Maybe you even competed in Bible bowls. Do you remember those? Anybody go to church where you competed? We used to have sword drills. Anybody know what a sword drill is? You say, that sounds crazy. Not real swords. We had the Bible was our sword. And so the teacher would say, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And you would have to pull your Bible up and find the reference and be able to say, John, chapter 14, you have to spit it out and say exactly where it's found and read it. Ah, I won the sword drill. I won the sword drill. Now, I'm not saying that learning about Jesus is not important. I'm not saying learning about Jesus is a non-important factor. I'm saying that it is not intimacy with Jesus. Clearly, where there is intimacy, there should be growing knowledge. But too often, there's knowledge without growing intimacy. Part of the proof that I have an intimate relationship with my wife, Jane, is I know a lot about her. I know a lot about her. I know what kind of soap she prefers. I know what kind of sushi she likes to order. I know what makes her laugh. I know what makes her cry. So knowledge is part of intimacy, but just because there is knowledge doesn't mean there is intimacy. Now probably the best word in all of the Bible for this intimacy, this knowledge and intimacy, is the little word know or knew, K-N-O-W or K-N-E-W. Let me show you a verse that's just... It's, it's, it's striking, and it's Jesus speaking in Matthew chapter 7, verse 22 and 23. Jesus says this, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? In other words, Lord, didn't we know the, didn't we know the words? Didn't we, didn't we do all of these things we thought were the right things to do? And I will tell them plainly, I never knew you, knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now, does that mean there's some people that Jesus doesn't know? Please understand, he knows all about us. But there are many of us who don't really want to know and love him, and that's what this word means. It means the knowing that comes when two become intimate with each other. This goes much deeper than just knowledge. I want you to see the root of this word in Hebrew. You find it in Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. Look on the screen. The King James says it like this. Adam knew Eve, his wife. Okay, what does that mean? Did he just know some stuff about her? In the New International, we get a clearer picture. The New International, same verse. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. Here's what I want you to get. The Hebrew word for new is the word Yada, Y-A-D-A, yada. And here's the best way to define the word. You may want to write this on your outline since we do have a teaching element in what we're doing. Yada means to know completely and to be completely known. To know completely and to be completely known. This is our context for yada. Now don't giggle or brush this aside. This is a big deal. We are talking about the intimate connection between two people who are deeply in love with each other and committed to each other. It is this intimate connection on every level that the Bible speaks of and how we are to know God, how we are to know Jesus. We are to intimately know him. It's a beautiful picture that helps us get at what it really means to know Christ. There are other Hebrew words that are used for just having a sexual relationship. No, this is more, so much more than that. This is knowing at the most intimate level. One Hebrew scholar defines this word this way. You may want to write this down. Yada means a mingling of souls. Yada means a mingling of souls. That's more than knowledge. That's intimacy. So now you understand that this word know is used to describe a man and a woman being intimate with each other. They yada each other. With that in mind, I want to talk to you about how God wants you to know him and be known by him. If you trace the use of the word yada through the Old Testament, you'll find it used over and over and over again. The same word for Adam knew Eve and gave birth to a, she gave birth to a son. That same word is used for how God knows you and how he wants you to know him. I'll show you one particular example, Psalm 139. Six times in these four verses, the word for new, yada, is used. This is about God. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. 
You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. It's powerful. This completely changed my way of knowing about God. I, I knew the answers. I was good with the trivia. You could ask me a Bible question and I knew it. But that didn't matter. What matters is, do you know Jesus? Do you yada Jesus? Do you know him intimately? Do you love him? Do you understand how much he loves you? In Luke 7, the Pharisee knew about him but didn't really know him. His heart was far from him. He didn't know that the visiting rabbi sitting at his table was the promised Messiah that he had spent countless hours studying about. Now Luke tells us, and this is where I want you to get the story, Luke tells us while Jesus is sitting there, reclined at the table, which is how they did it, they reclined at a table, there weren't chairs like we have now, a woman comes in who is a sinner. Now they were in a courtyard area, imagine a courtyard off of the house, they're in a courtyard area, people could hear what they're talking about. A woman walks up who is a sinner, we find out she is a prostitute. We imagine that she has heard Jesus talk, teach she has heard him talk she has listened to his message she has heard about God's great love for all people she has maybe realized that that finally meant her that she was not beyond repair that God loved her we don't know we don't know maybe it wasn't even his teaching maybe it was just a look in his eye there was some point in time when she saw the look of Jesus eye that says I don't judge you I love you you are not this bad person that you think you are You are a daughter of God, my child. I don't know what it was. Something, though, did something inside of her. She didn't want to go to Simon's house. Nothing about going to Simon's house had ever appealed to her. She was an outcast. She was talked about at Simon's house. She would never go into his house. But she had fallen madly in love with Jesus. And so she goes in to the courtyard area. And she's standing at Jesus' feet. And you can see Simon beginning to bristle. Others are beginning to murmur that are sitting around this little courtyard. And Jesus looks up at her and he smiles at her. That beautiful smile that says, I know you. You're good. God loves you. And she fell down at his knees, or at his feet, and she began to cry. And the tears began to splash on his feet, which were dirty. Because Simon had not chosen to give him water to clean his feet. And she did the most natural thing to her. She pulled her hair down. Women's hair was up. It was really scandalous for a woman to bring her hair down in front of a man, not her husband, kind of scandalous in that world. But she was not thinking like that. She brought her hair down, and as the tears splashed on his feet, she began to take her hair, and she began to wash his dirty feet. She loved him. She was intimate with him. She yada him. It wasn't sexual. It was an intimate love for him. He had seen something deep inside of her. He was different than anybody she had ever known before. She began to cleanse his feet with her tears. And then she had a little necklace that had a little container that had alabaster oil, a perfume, really. It was perfume that women used, and a woman who was a prostitute would use it often just a different smell for a different man, but she wasn't thinking about that. She was thinking, I have used this for the wrong purposes my whole life, but she opens that up and she anoints Jesus with that oil, and she is having a moment with him. She is crying. She feels so free. This is an amazing thing, and Simon is sitting back saying, this man is no prophet. If he was a prophet, he would know what kind of woman this woman is. And Jesus sees this, and he reads his mind. He knows exactly what he's thinking. And Jesus says this to him. Look on the screens. He turns to the woman and says to Simon, look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss. But from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. 
You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. Jesus said to Simon, Simon, she has been forgiven and understands that forgiveness. You think you have no need of forgiveness. She has done a good thing. I want to give you three quick, quick little sentences to write down about knowledge of Jesus that's real love of him, yada, of him. Because that's what we need, not just one more fact to go in our head. Write this down, please. Loving Jesus comes from recognizing how he takes me from a lower place to a higher place by his grace and by his love. That's a true statement. Knowing or loving Jesus comes from recognizing how he takes me from a lower place to a higher place by his grace and love. That's what the woman was feeling. She couldn't have told you all the prophecies in the Old Testament. She would have struck out. She didn't know any of those answers. She just knew that he looked at her with a look that says, you are a daughter of God. You have potential in your life beyond anything you've ever known. And you are not being judged by any mistakes in your past. Yesterday morning, Jane and I had a meeting with a young couple that were going to be doing their mar- uh, wedding in a couple of months. And uh, we left, and we were just smitten by the fact that the groom said to me, from the moment I met her, my life has gone up. He said, my grades, we both were going to college. He said, until I met her, my grades were here. But when I met her, everything has been like this. And I thought, well, she's, I feel that way about my wife. I feel like when I met her, life has just been up. It's just been better. She's made me a better man. But you know what? That's what our heart should feel like about Jesus. We should all be able to go back and say, you know what? And I'm not saying that everybody had to be in prison to be able to understand this, or everybody had to be a drug addict to be able to understand this, or maybe your life had to be wrecked and ruined and living in your car to understand this. I'm saying all of us, regardless of where you have been, need to be able to look back and say, You know what, when I met him, he took me to a higher level. He raised me up. He's brought me into a new place that I didn't know existed. Number two, write this down. Knowing and loving Jesus, knowing and loving Jesus trumps all the Bible knowledge you might ever have. Knowing and loving Jesus trumps all the Bible knowledge you might ever have. I don't know about you, but I have known some mean people who knew a lot about the Bible. But they were mean as snakes. Y'all have known some of them? I've known some of them. That's not, the, uh, that's not the, what we're shooting for, is a bunch of mean people that can quote the Bible. That's not what we're shooting for. I believe Jesus is the highest revelation the world has of God and his love. Let me say it again. Jesus is the highest revelation the world has ever known of God and his love. The Bible is not equal to Jesus. The Bible points us to Jesus But Jesus is the highest revelation, not the Bible. Jesus is the highest revelation, not the Bible. The Bible points us to him. It tells us about him. But we worship him, not the Bible. To worship the Bible is called bibliolatry. It's not something that's good. We don't worship the Bible. We worship Jesus. We worship Jesus that we learn about in the Bible. And the third thing I want to say is this, knowing and loving Jesus teaches you all that you need to know about life and death. When you know and love Jesus, really know and love Jesus, it teaches you all you need to know about life and about death. The Bible is clear. We are to love God and we are to love others. We are to love God and we are to love others. The Bible is clear. Troubles will come. But Jesus promises us he will not leave us. He'll be with us. The Bible says Jesus will be with us here and he will prepare a home for us beyond this life. Y'all, Jesus is gentle. When you need a soft voice to speak to you when your heart is broken, he does not come down on you like a father that doesn't know what he's doing. He comes down and speaks to you in a way that you can understand gently. He is gentle. He is kind. Some of you have never thought about the Lord being kind. He is kind. 
Oh, he is also strong. And when he needs to be strong, he will be strong for you. He can be fierce. Certainly he can be fierce. He can be playful. Can you imagine him sitting in a room full of people and saying to them, you know, so many of you, you see a little speck in your neighbor's eye of dust and you want to preach to him about that dust in your neighbor's eye while you have a two-by-four sticking out of your eye. That's playful when you think about what he's saying. He believes more good about you than you believe about yourself. He believes more good about you than you believe about yourself. He's never given up on you. When Simon Peter wanted to give up on himself, Jesus said, I'm not giving up on you. I haven't given up on you, Peter. He shows us how to love. He shows us how to forgive. He teaches us how to walk humbly with our God. He is willing to die for us. And then his resurrection teaches us that his power is real and it is available to us. That same power that raised Jesus from the dead, Jesus says now is available to each of us. So whatever struggle you have, do you think it is stronger than the resurrection power of Jesus? In just a moment, the praise team is going to come back and we're going to all sing a couple of choruses of Because He Lives. Because that's the truth. Because He lives, you can face tomorrow. Because He lives, all your fears of yesterday can be gone. Because He lives. Are you a fan or are you a follower? Do you know a lot of facts? Or have you fallen in love with Jesus? And are you willing to bow at his feet with tears streaming down your face? Because he alone has touched you and changed you and made a life that maybe didn't have the greatest potential have absolutely the greatest potential. Would you stand to your feet, would bow your heads as, as I pray. Father, I thank you for this moment. I thank you for every person here and I thank you for the way that they have listened, and I thank you for the fact that we need to love Jesus intimately. We need to yada him, yada you. Not a matter of knowing facts, not a matter of trivial pursuit, not a matter of being able to name the tribes of Israel, but more knowing your heart, knowing your heart for people, knowing your heart for relationships, knowing your wisdom as we walk through this life, knowing what you say to us when we fail, knowing what you say to us when we want to get arrogant and too big for our, our britches, knowing what you say to us when we're frightened about tomorrow and we don't know what we're going to do, knowing what to say to us when we feel like some foe is too big to conquer. But if we know you, really know you, intimately know and love you, we can have victory. Thank you for that, oh God. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.